Hello, everybody. Welcome to the January 27th, 2017 edition of the Intuit Developer Friday Morning Hangout. I'm your host, David Leary. And today we have a special guest, Peter Vogel and Peter Lavelle, both from Intuit, uh, one solutions architect and one a solutions engineer. We're doing an encore presentation of their QuickBooks Connect presentation, App Integration Best Design Practices. It was one of the uh, highest rated sessions at QuickBooks Connect for developers. So I hope you enjoy it. For those of you that are not uh, attending live, this will be on YouTube and hope you enjoy the presentation on YouTube. And uh, with that said, Peter Vogel, I will hand off to you. Thanks, David. Um, Cool, so uh, we'll just uh, dive right in um, with a quick introduction. Um, so I'm Peter Vogel, um, I'm a solutions architect here at um, Intuit. I've been here uh, just about 15 years now, um, and all 15 of those years I've been working with developers, helping them to integrate with uh, QuickBooks, originally QuickBooks Desktop and QuickBooks Online, now uh, primarily uh, devoted to QuickBooks Online. Thanks. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Peter Lavelle. I'm a IDG integration engineer. So I've worked for Intuit for about uh, five years now. Um, so I've helped a lot of developers build applications. I've also built a, built a number of applications myself uh, while I've been here. Um, so today, uh, while Peter walks us through the best practices, I'm going to go ahead and develop an application here at the same time and we can kind of see how I'm doing along the way. Awesome. Cool. So uh, just a quick agenda. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why best practices matter at all. Um, and uh, a, a key driver for um, understanding those best practices is understanding why customers even want apps to be integrated with QuickBooks. And then we'll get into the um, best practices, the what, and then uh, Peter will show us a little bit of the how. Um, and then a quick summary. We, we have some uh, key takeaways on a couple of slides, so we have a, a summary slide for that, kind of your photo opportunity slide, and then uh, we'll be open for, for Q&A. So we'll jump right in. Uh, why, why do best practices matter? Um, so just a couple of uh, interesting uh, quotes from various App Center reviews and uh, customer interviews and things like that. Um, things like, software is not easy to use. It's got a lot of sync issues. Um, or, we installed this app, unfortunately that's where the problem started. This app creates new customers, new products, new invoices. In essence, it's creating double counting of all transactions that are already in QBO. Ouch. Um, that's exactly the kind of review we hate to see. Um, and uh, if you're the guy, uh, the, the team that's just spent um, uh, weeks or months uh, building an integration, that's the last thing you want to see. Um, or even worse, not sure why anyone would use this app. Um, so fundamentally, the net promoter score uh, and reviews are critical to your success on our platform. Um, now, this, this data is as of QB Connect. I'm pretty sure the numbers have grown since then, but um, there are 427 apps on apps.com. Um, there's an aver average rating of three stars. But fewer than 75% have even one review, uh, which means that you're not really delighting people and you're not really ex getting people um, irritated, but um, it's still not great. Um, over 15% of QuickBooks users, this penetration is, is higher than it's ever been in my career at Intuit. Um, over 15% of QuickBooks users have connected at least one app, and that number continues to go up and to the right. It's, it's great to see. Um, 50% of users simply will not try an app if it's got a rating of three stars or less. Um, and accountants have an even higher bar. They want their, that app to have at least four stars before they're willing to go and um, mess with it. So there are. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this all, this all makes sense. You know, I, I think it's really exciting that, you know, such a big part of the QBO user base is using apps. and. Yeah. Um, I think I have something ready to show you that's at least five stars. I don't know if you guys could add an extra star for my app, but um, can I take the control for a yeah, second? Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. Cool. Let me share my screen. All right. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Here's my application. I've named it Sync Etsy. So my application takes all of your Etsy transactions and syncs them over to QuickBooks. Nice and nice and simply, you'll see it's it's almost like two steps, which is really awesome. Uh, you can see here that I've you know I've also taken into all the you know 
uh, Intuit developer requirements for my application. So right here we can see, you know, sign in with Intuit. I'll show you the connect to QuickBooks button and I'll also show you log out. So I've met all those requirements. You know, it's really just, I, I really just love to get your feedback on the experience okay. here and, you know, just your validation that it is a five star experience. Yeah, cool. Like I yeah, said. Great. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and click my button to sign, sign in with Intuit. Right now it's actually going to sign, sign me up for this application too. So I'm going to sign in and sign up. Click sign in. So I'm all signed in and ready to go right now. So all I really need to do is connect to QuickBooks and to Etsy to get started. Okay. So you can see I, I have my connect to QuickBooks widget here, which I'm going to click. Opens up a new pop-up window, which is part of your requirements. Um, I'm going to authorize the connection between my application, which is Sync Etsy, and my QuickBooks company here, which is Peter's Petite Pottery. So let's go ahead and click authorize to get access. Uh, okay, let me take a break, break point here, off. but everyone can see that this is live code, which is awesome. All right, let's go back. So I've connected my QuickBooks company here. Okay. Next step, once step two out of two now is just to click uh, connect to Etsy and allow ac uh, access to my Etsy company. So now I've set up my two connections. It says my sync is running. Click here to check the status. Boom. We're running already, and let me switch over to QuickBooks here and show you actually what I'm creating. So you can see how simple that was. Holy 90 days of transactions? Like, yeah, automatically, right? Okay. Well, I assume that's what customers wanted. So um, let's go ahead and refresh this page. And I'll show you the awesome transaction that I'm creating too. Now, I didn't really talk to any customers, but I, I'm making some assumptions here. Um, so you can see I am bringing over the sales receipt date, which is pretty great. I'm sticking into undeposited funds right here. Uh, I wasn't sure where to put the money actually, so undeposited funds seemed appropriate because I don't know where to put it. Um, you can see that I'm setting it to a default product or service because I'm really not sure where the customer wants this money to go. Yeah. I figured they could come in here and change it later. Um, you can see my description is awesome. It's an Etsy sale, right? And then I have my full amount here. This amount is actually um, <clears throat> includes all the taxes and shipping and everything. So. Mm -hmm. I've, Kind of bundle that all into one line and the best part is my memo so something fun to see every day when you look at your sales receipts it says etsy sale cha-ching what do you think yeah probably not five stars no uh yeah okay um, so you know just a couple of examples here um you know uh, okay i know it's an etsy sale but but what did i actually sell on Etsy? oh good point um, okay and then um, you know, we'll talk about this in a second as to why customers want these integrations, but um, you've bundled kind of the entire cost into one line there. Yeah. Um, but part of that was sales tax. Um, sure, and that's yeah. that's actually a liability to me. I got to pay oh. that back to some agency. You're counting it just as income yeah, there and, and that sort of thing. So um, let, let's dive into some of the best practices a little bit more. Okay, and, I'll uh, keep working on it over here. And, and you can you can keep working over there. Right. Yeah. Um, cool. So um, I think it starts with why customers even want these integrations. Uh, so um, you know, from the research we've done, the average small business is using about eight applications throughout the course of the business day to just run their business and when you think about it everything a small business does i mean everything is ultimately going to touch money or time and as we all know time is money um and so uh you want to be able to capture the accounting outcomes of running your business and you want to do that as smoothly as possible because fundamentally Nobody, unless you're an accountant, got into business to do accounting. You got into business because you have a passion for whatever your business is about, whether it's about radio control hobbies or um, fitness or anything else. Um, that's what you're passionate about. That's what you're excited about. That's why you got into business. You didn't get into business because you want to do accounting. It's that necessary evil. Um, and fundamentally, you know, government compliance requires accounting. Um, you have to file your income taxes. You have to file your sales and use taxes. There have actually been cases in um, the EU of people getting off a plane 
and being arrested for not having complied with sales tax laws um, or VAT tax laws. Um, payroll taxes, same kind of thing. Um, and getting a small business loan uh, requires accounting. Um, uh, I, I remember um, going on a, a sailboat ride in, in San Francisco Bay, talking to the owner of that uh, business, and she said it was just amazing for her that she was able to go into the bank, um, apply for a loan, hand them a few reports straight out of QuickBooks, and the loan was approved. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and that's that's why people need to have the accounting, but it's not what they got into business to do. And, and, and so we really think that accounting should be an invisible result of running your business rather than something that you have to go and do every day, some drudgery where you're typing data into QuickBooks. Um, so that's fundamentally why people want this. Um, so it's uh, uh, time to look at, at some of those best practices and, uh, and maybe you can uh, uh, take a, a step further with your app. Um, fundamentally, when you're writing data to QuickBooks, as, as you just did, um, you're taking on a responsibility of maintaining the accuracy of your customer's books. Okay. Um, and it's really tempting to take shortcuts. Um, so there's some fees. Can't I just record an expense for them? And why do I have to record a deposit for the money that I put in the user's bank? Um, and like you did, can't I just record everything against one sales item? Well, if you do that, you can't really tell what you've been selling. The, the sales by item report becomes useless in QuickBooks. Oh, um, and you know, why does the customer's address matter? Well, especially in the United States, uh, the address to which you shipped um, uh, your product uh, fundamentally defines what sales tax uh, needs to be collected. And it, it gets as complex as down to the housetop makes a difference. Um, my favorite example, uh, there's one corner in um, uh, Colorado where, depending on which of the four uh, points of that corner, or even just um, one house down, there's five different tax jurisdictions oh, oh, um, no. going on there. So it actually matters which okay. house you're shipping to. Um, and so that's why the customer's address uh, really matters. So accuracy is paramount. You really can't take shortcuts when you're writing data to the user's books. Okay, I think this this really helped me a lot. I, I, it makes more sense to me now that I can't just shove everything into sales. So I've been doing some coding over here. Do you mind if I show you what I've done? Go for it. Okay, cool. All right, so I've made some changes to my program here. You can still you can see that it's still a simple two-step sync. Um, I've already you know done the part of uh, creating my connections here, so we can just go see that everything's connected. Um, my sync is running. Let's check on the status again. It says sync is running. I'm sticking with 90 days for now. Um, okay. I did talk to my account. We didn't get into the 90 days sync, but we did talk about um, what I'm creating as transactions in QuickBooks. Okay. So. I, I did get some great advice from my accountant there too, in addition to your advice. Um, so let's let's see what actually I'm creating in QuickBooks now, and I'd love to get your. All right, great. So I think you're going to find this uh, hopefully a lot improved over the last sync that I did. Okay. Um, so like you said, I've started to bring over that that customer detail. I do have very high profile customers. Uh, Julia Roberts is one of my uh, best clients. Um, you can see that I'm bringing over her address here. I'm keeping that sales receipt date. Mm -hmm. um, I actually bring over the payment method now as Etsy as well, so, awesome. so uh, uh, my customers you know, can see their reports by payment method. I bring over the Etsy reference number now so the user can look back at Etsy and, and map the two and make sure that it's accurate. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm still going to undeposited funds for now. Um, we can talk about that a bit and I can get mm -hmm. your feedback yep. hopefully. But you can see here, this is where I made uh, my, my really big changes. So I'm actually uh, syncing over the product or service now from Etsy right into awesome. QuickBooks, right? Um, so you can see, right, Julia bought a petite platter, which is one of my most popular items. Um, you can see the description there. It's a platter, but it can't hold much. It's a, it's a really funny little platter. Yep. Uh, so the amount for that platter itself is $544. But the, the shipping on that platter is actually almost as expensive because it's very delicate, right? Yep. 
So I've actually separated out my shipping costs now. So it really gives my user a lot more insight into you know what's happening with their business. Okay. And on top of that, I've also broken out, out the sales tax as well. So you can see that um, Julia was charged with 6% sales tax at our, at our home address there. Um, so I broke that out here. Um, a couple more cool features. I cleaned up my message on the sales receipt a little bit. Um, and I also added a memo with a link uh, to the receipt in Etsy. So another That's way to awesome. reconcile. Yeah, so, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, one more thing too, okay. so before I get your feedback. I also start to bring over refunds too. So George Clooney tends to return a lot of things. I don't know if he doesn't like my products, but he buys a lot. Um, but I'm also bringing over all the refunds too. So trying to get all this detail from Etsy into QuickBooks so that my customers can really make informed decisions. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So that, this is a significant improvement. Cool. Thank um, you. I think you've addressed a, a lot of issues. Um, uh, so. Um, in, in the end, you're going to wind up with a whole bunch of sales receipts. Looks like quite a few there for $616, given yeah. your um, average sale price is pretty low. Um, and uh, ultimately, I assume that's going through Etsy payments or something it like is. that. Yeah, yeah, and gets deposited um, to the bank. Yeah. Um, so the, the problem the customer is going to have now is they've got this ton of sales receipts that have just dropped into their um, uh, books. but they have no way of matching that to what's coming from the bank, um, where the oh, bank says, okay. hey, $500 yeah. just got deposited, or where'd that $500 mm -hmm. come from, oh. which of those sales receipts were included, and so forth. Oh, okay. So uh, let's, let's, let's... Sounds like I have more it, work to do. It's a significant improvement, but okay. uh, let's take it a step further. Let me uh, go into some more um, best practices. Great. Um, by the way, I, your setup, everybody is always tempted to make their setup as streamlined as possible. Yeah, two steps, right? Um, and it's it's interesting. The truth is there's really no one-size-fits-all default setup for an app. Okay. Um, fundamentally, businesses are unique. Their chart of accounts is unique. Um, and, and their needs are, are unique. Um, so you created some items there, like petite um, uh, platter, but what um, income account did you tie them to and that sort of thing? Um, that will depend um, potentially on the item itself and, and so forth. Um, and so the reality is there's no one size fits all. And um, when customers have that kind of setup experience, we've actually experimented with it. Um, they lose confidence because they're not, sh they're like, yeah, it, it can't possibly do the right thing because it didn't ask me the right yeah, questions. I get it. And accountants are even more sensitive to that. Um, but the flip side is that users are not always totally familiar with accounting themselves. Uh, in fact, most of the time they're not. So you got to set the context of what they're doing during that setup process and why. Guide the user through that process. And when you're dealing with the accounting setup, um, use the QuickBooks terminology um, and tie it back to your terminology. But um, so when you're dealing with your data, you're using your terminology. And when you're talking about QuickBooks, you're talking about QuickBooks terminology. So for example, orders from Etsy will be synced to sales receipts in QuickBooks, uh, that sort of thing. You do want to provide reasonable defaults for the person who really isn't sure yet um, and guide them through that. Um, allow the user to override those defaults and um, uh, allow the user to create anything they might need on the fly. So if you need the bank account to which things are deposited and they haven't yet created that bank account in QuickBooks, like they might be new users to QuickBooks, um, let go ahead and create the bank account for them. Um, rather than making them go back to QuickBooks, create the bank account, then come back to you and reload data and, and things like that. Um, then summarize their choices and the effects of those choices. Um, uh, just show that summary of the data that you would write before you write it for the first time. Or even better, write a really small amount of data. You're doing 90 days, um, and, and that just gives me the willies. Um, thinking about 90 days worth of transactions Get dumping into the user's books, um, if you got something wrong or the user set something wrong, uh, suddenly they're going to have, you know, let's say they do one transaction a day, that's 90 transactions. Um, if it's a more typical e-commerce business, they've got tens of transactions a day. So now they've got 900 plus transactions that have just dropped into their books um, that are wrong 
maybe because of their own fault. They made some wrong setting choices, but now they got to go clean that up. That's 900 transactions they got to go delete. Yeah, that's um, okay. And uh, I, I tell you, I've been on some uh, customer calls um, just wying into our support center, and uh, the, the disbelief in the user's... Um, voice when they hear they got to go delete that stuff manually is um, painful to hear. Um, so you want the user to leave your setup process really confident that the accounting is going to be correct and the data is going to flow into their company correctly. Um, you have a nice streamlined setup, but I don't have any confidence that the right thing is going to happen. And, and quite honestly, for most of the users that um, I've observed, uh, when they see that we're going to sync 90 days of, of transactions, they'd be disconnecting instantly because they're not sure that data is going to come yeah, in right. Makes sense. Okay, so let me, this is some great advice. Let, let me show you what I've done okay. uh, yeah, great. to hopefully address this problem somewhat. Um, I, I have some more work to do, but I think you'll like what you see. Okay, awesome. All right, so. I made some more changes to my application, and let's go ahead and, and run it again. All right, so you can see that now there's four steps. So I, I got okay. rid of the whole two-step thing. Um, you can see um, my connections are still connected here, but now there's a, a, a little new um, option I have, which is change my sync configuration. Okay, great. Right? So I talked to some of my uh, potential users, and I really talked to them about each setting that they want to do, that yeah. they want, right? So I did some customer interviews, and it turns out that they actually do want, they do want a lot of customization, like you were yeah. saying. Um, so you can see that here I presented a, a group of, um, you know, configuration page so they can change some of these things. So first one, like you said, is days of historical transactions to sync. Instead of defaulting to 90, I actually default to 30 now. Yep. Make it a little rest, less risky, and I let the customer choose whether they want to increase that or actually do none. So they could choose to have Just none go there. forward. Yeah, yeah exactly. They could even then at that point do a test order exactly. through Etsy and yep. find out. That's, that's, a, that's a great great idea yep. too. Um, I, <clears throat> I also give them the option of importing that customers or their items. So if they don't want all of that detail actually brought in, yep. you know, some. Some of my customers do really small microtransactions all the time, and they, they don't want hundreds of customers coming in all day. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I gave them that option. Same with items. Um, income type um, for the funds received through Etsy. Uh, expense type. Payment method and default sales tax. So I really give them all that flexibility that you were talking about. Um, and, you know, hopefully it's, it's something that, that the customers will love. So let's, let's look at an example of this. Like I said, one of my customers really doesn't um, like all these customers yeah. coming over for the, the tiny transactions. So I'm going to change that setting. I'm going to click Save. Uh, and then let's go ahead and look at our, our, our status. Um, here's something else I added, too, is that I now give the user control over when, when Sync runs and when Sync doesn't run. Yep. So instead of just running in the background all the time, the user can click a button and get it started. Yep. So I'll kick that off. Um, let's switch over to QuickBooks again and see if our uh, custom settings um, did the job. I'm going to refresh my page here. And look at that. So the, the customer, my customer chose uh, not to sync all that detail over yep. into QuickBooks. And That's you great. can see that I respected that uh, configuration choice here. I kept all the other detail, um, but now the, the customer is no longer shown. So I, I did give a lot of that control back to the user, and um, thank you for that advice. I, I think I'm going to get a lot more uh, great feedback. Awesome. Yeah. I, um, I think that you did exactly the right thing there for the most part. Um, uh, you know, we hear this a lot from customers. Uh, look, I don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry who orders from my website once to flow into QuickBooks. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of the nuance there is sometimes if a website has a registration process, so if somebody actually through the checkout process registers as a customer, that's a really good indication that they're going to be a repeat customer. Oh, okay. And you may want that customer to flow over, but everything else to, you know, every um, just anonymous customer who comes over across, just come across as um, uh, a customer that's specific to that shop, that channel, because oh, we know a lot of um, uh, businesses are selling through multiple channels, Etsy, Amazon, etc. 
and um, they like to uh, be able to see a report of how much are they selling through one channel versus the other oh, channel. And an easy way to do that right now is to look at sales by customer. So I could almost right here uh, have an Etsy customer, customer that, exactly. I, that I default yep. to. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's go a little bit further. Let me uh, get okay. a sharing going again here. Um, so kind of the next step, you, you're bringing in a lot of sales receipt and that's awesome. Um, and I hinted at this earlier, you really want to make sure that bank activity matches business activity. Um, because in the end, people have bank feeds connected, they're going to see that $500 deposit um, from Etsy, but they don't know which of the hundreds of sales receipts you brought in are tied to that. Um, and you know, typically, especially with payment processing, um, there are fees associated with that that gets deducted before it gets deposited mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's really hard to match things up um, manually. In fact, when I've done it manually, I've literally spent hours every week um, to reconcile the um, various reconcil reconciliation reports from my payments processors to the data that's in QuickBooks. And it's, it's really painful. Yeah. So you want to make sure that bank activity matches your business activity. Um, that warm and fuzzy feeling customers get when they see that this bank deposit has been matched to a deposit that came from your app, that's powerful and, and um, uh, really drives up the, the positive um, reviews. Um, so the bank business needs to be traceable to the customer and vendor business. Um, banks see a thin sliver. They see the money in and the money out, uh, but they can't explain why the money came in or came out. Um, so you want to take your data to the bank, literally. Um, so uh, like I said, lots of those business transactions, no tie to the bank data is just more work for the bookkeeper um, to go about it. So if you look at that deposit transaction there, um, you've got the existing payments that came in um, and you check off which ones there are. And if you have hundreds of sales receipts, that's a lot of checking off to do. Yeah. Um, that can be taken care of automatically. And then down at the bottom, we have that account line that says um, there were some payment services fees charged, um, $23.10. So I did $770 in sales, $23.10 was taken out. And um, so the actual deposit to my bank account is seven to get the recording going. There we go. So the, the key takeaway here is really, if your data doesn't match the bank data, something has gone wrong. Uh, you've gotten it wrong. Um, and so there are two techniques for payments reconciliation uh, that I like to use. Um, one is transfer-based, the other is deposit-based. Um, on the transfer-based, uh, this is the simplest way to go, um, and uh, it's, it's less ideal, but you use it when you don't know which sales are included in a bank deposit at the point where you're doing the reconciliation. Uh, depending on which systems you're integrating with, you may not have the data you need in order to create a deposit. Um, and you can use this if the payment system looks like a bank. Uh, PayPal is the best example of this. PayPal doesn't ever automatically deposit to your bank. Um, They're just accumulating a balance in the PayPal account. Um, and then you're manually transferring um, out of PayPal. So. Uh, you can you can behave this way. Um, so you record sales to a payments holding account. So if I'm using Shopify, for example, I'd record those to the Shopify payments holding account. Um, and then those sales receipts, instead of going to undeposited funds, would be recorded as um, going to that holding account. Um, and then you record deposits to the bank as a transfer from the holding account to the bank account with the amount, the amount that's matching the reconciliation okay. report that you get from Shopify payments. And you record the fees and holdbacks, um, et cetera, as purchases drawn from that holding account. Um, and so in the end, uh, and then of course refunds are also drawn from that same holding account. You did the refund transaction earlier. So the, the end result is the balance in that holding account is literally how much money uh, has been collected by the payment system but has not yet been deposited to your bank. Um, and uh, the deposit to your bank is exactly how much was reconciled and deposited to your bank, so you'll get an exact match from um, the, the bank feed. Um, 
and you have you're still accounting for all the fees etc that have been taken out um, so your profit and loss report is going to be correct um, so that's when you don't have all the data you need in order to create a deposit um, if you have the right data at the right time by far and away the best way to do this is to use the deposit transaction um, so then you're recording sales to undeposited funds as you are um, you record the deposit to the bank based on that payment reconciliation report. So you're looking at the payment reconciliation report. It says, hey, these 10 transactions, and gives the transaction ID of each one, um, were deposited um, to your bank account. These fees were extracted before we deposited. Um, most payment systems are using a net deposit, not a gross deposit. So, um, And so you create that um, deposit linking the deposit to the various sales transactions that are included in the deposit. You add the account-based lines um, to capture the fees, holdbacks, refunds, et cetera, that were taken out of that. Um, and the, the result is the total matches what the bank sees. Um, and that needs to be an exact match. Um, and when that happens, again, the customer gets that incredibly warm and fuzzy feeling that everything's um, working the way they want it to. Um, and you, you touched on this as well in your, in your last um, iteration here. Um, you're avoiding irrelevant data and you're keeping the relevant data in sync. Um, because not all data is relevant to all users. Um, E-commerce merchants don't want a unique QBO customer for every order, but they might want the repeat customers to be synced over. Um, and inventory, when it's used, is really critical. And QBO is really growing up rapidly here. Um, you know, traditionally QBO was a service-based business um, uh, application, and so it didn't do a whole lot with inventory, et cetera, but we've really caught up um, over the last uh, year or so. Um, and there's lots of systems out there that have inventory. Um, your Amazon store will have inventory, your Etsy store will have inventory, your Shopify store will have inventory, et cetera. Um, but only QBO actually knows the accounting for that inventory. As soon as you have inventory items, now you have cost of goods sold, which is a line on your um, P&L. And so uh, it, QBO needs to be treated, treated as the source of truth for the accounting aspects of inventory. Um, inventory is also an asset to the business. So when you look at the balance sheet, um, the inventory is a key part of that. And the quantity on hand is only part of the story. There's the asset value and the COGS. Um, QuickBooks doesn't know everything about inventory. Um, it probably never will. Um, you know, you've got multiple pictures, detailed descriptions, and so forth that are really a part of how you sell the product, not about how you account for it. Um, and so there's a shared truth that ne is needed between the systems. Um, and just know in your system what's the master for each field of an inventory item. And yeah, it does mean you've got a bi-directional data flow going on. Um, you're reading inventory from QuickBooks, um, uh, possibly allocating that out to the various channels um, that you're syncing with, um, and uh, you're um, writing data back to QuickBooks if a um, purchase is recorded or, and, and so forth. So you, you've got to keep inventory in sync between the systems, um, and QuickBooks takes care of the accounting side of the inventory, and the other systems take care of the uh, available to sell accounts and things like that. Um, and you need to be really clear on how to handle missing items when syncing with QBO. Um, it's really common in the e-commerce world. The most important thing when items become available is get them on your website so that you can start selling them. And you may forget to go and enter them in QBO. Um, so uh, when that item sells, you still need to be able to write that sale over to QuickBooks. Um, so create your items um, with a default income account that the user tells you to use, a default asset account that the user tells you to use, and a default um, cost of goods sold account. Um, and then um, if you can't be certain uh, whether the user wants to treat an item as an inventory item or a non-inventory item, um, then it's best to err on the side of caution and um, just create it as a non-inventory item, because it's easy to convert a non-inventory item to an inventory item in QuickBooks, 
once something's an inventory item in QuickBooks, you can't demote it to a non-inventory item. Um, so let the user help you there by just creating the item. Now you're at least tracking the sale, um, and they can take care of the um, cost of goods sold and um, asset value, et cetera, aspects of that item by when they promote it to an inventory item. Um, so um, getting comfortable with this concept of shared truth between different systems that hold different aspects of the same data um, is really critical um, to the system's workflow, and it's, it's fundamentally the new normal as you start to deal with um, inventory across multiple systems. Because uh, And just be aware of what's the source of truth for each field within the broader inventory item. Oh, good. Thanks, Peter. You know, I think um, one of the real um, drawbacks in my application that my users were saying after the last iteration was that I'm, I'm just dumping everything in, into undeposited funds, right? And I'm not matching those deposits. So I think, you know, Etsy is a deposit based uh, type of uh, system. So I made those changes in my application. Can, awesome. I, can I show you yeah, those? Yeah, go for it. So I think this is really going to help my, my user complete that accounting picture, um, or at least more so than my, than, than my last version. So let me take control of the screen here. All right, Brandon, we're going to see my same lovely interface come up here that all my users love. All right, cool. Again, we have our customize our sync settings. I'm going to actually uh, turn this back to yes, sync all customer information. I really like that. Um, and let's go over to my status. And I'm going to kick this off here. So nothing, not too much has changed with the, the front end and as to what the user sees. Um, but the real magic is now when we switch back over to QuickBooks. Um, and so let's bring up QuickBooks here. So uh, one thing I want to show you first is that I've added my bank account here. Okay. Um, so you can see I have all of my uh, Etsy deposits coming in here. Mm -hmm. I have some pottery expenses, of course. Um, but these deposits are really, you know, what I what I want to match for my customers, yep. right? Exactly. Um, so let's go back and look at my sales transactions and see how the import is doing. All right, looks like my import is going well. I'm getting my sales receipts and refunds. So let's go back here to our banking tab. Now the real cool thing here, Peter, is that you can see I've yeah. started to get matches, right? Which, yes. is, which is awesome. So let's expand one of these matches. And take a look at this deposit. I think you're going to see a lot of what you're just talking about. Awesome. So here's here's my deposit now. So this is matching what Etsy deposits into my bank. Um, so you can see I have all those existing payments that I was talking about. Yep. You know, Leo and, and Matt, those friends of mine. Uh, Jody Foster wanted a refund, so that was actually part of this deposit as well. Yep. Is that uh, Etsy took that money? You know, took that money back. Of course, awesome. Right. Yep. So I've included that. And what I've been missing this whole time are the fees that Etsy charges, of course, yeah. right? So I've always been a little off in my transaction. So um, you can see that I've included all those fees here, and, and the fees come in when uh, Etsy goes to make that deposit. They, they take yeah. their, their little chunk out, right? Um, and then we, we end up with our final amount here of 15.52. So now if we go back to our banking page, <clears throat> uh, we can see that that exactly matches uh, what came in through my bank account. And I can just click match right here, and boom, my, my reconciliation is done. Um, I know that those Etsy transactions that came in and the fees that they all you know reconciled perfectly with my um, bank account, which is my source of truth. Yep. Uh, and now I feel much better at the end of the day that I'm 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 getting much closer to doing the accounting right. Absolutely. This is this is what accountants love to see is when the bank feed is actually matching business activity that's already been recorded in QuickBooks. Awesome. This is um, this is solid gold, even though the, the light there is green uh, for a match. Uh, we like the QuickBooks green. Um, and, uh, you know, that fees, yes, um, it's necessary to record that um, in the deposit. But there's another aspect to that, which is um, this is the first time in your application that I'm not going to be overpaying my income tax. Oh, because okay. um, all those fees being taken out, uh, that's an expense to my business that gets, comes straight off of my 
uh, income uh, line. So uh, that's really important at tax time. Oh, great. Um, Thank you. So uh, awesome stuff there. So I think there's just one piece still missing, and that's you know when when you go to your um, sync status, it says just sit back, relax. I'm syncing. Yep. Um, and I just I have no confidence at all that that's really happening unless I go in QuickBooks and I go in and see yeah. okay yeah right. the transactions come in the transactions come in um, but uh, you know users expectations are really weird here um, you know a sale occurred five seconds ago and they're hopping over to QuickBooks to see if it's there. Peter, it looks like maybe we lost your room. If everybody could sit tight, we'll try and figure out what's going on. We lost, uh, seem to lost Peter and Peter here. Hollywood skills. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think we were just starting on insight and control. So um, it's it's actually really important to give the user insight into and control the state of the sync. Um, uh, things we hear from, from users all the time, why isn't this app syncing? Uh, it's working great, at least I think so. I'm not really sure how to check whether anything's happening. Um, that, that kind of lack of confidence is uh, something we want to avoid. So at the very least, you want to show the status of the sync. When did you last sync? What data did you create? Um, and when you show the data that you created, um, if you created, say, 10 sales receipts or um, something along those lines, then um, you want to uh, deep link to that. Um, we have an ability to link within Quick to link to any transaction in QuickBooks, so take advantage of that. Um, you know the you know the transaction ID you created, link to it. Um, let me know when you're going to sync next, um, and let me know if any errors occurred. Um, you know, stuff happens. Um, uh, the data that you get from one system uh, may not actually be clean as far as um, uh, QuickBooks business logic is, is concerned. Um, we actually saw this um, with PayPal uh, beyond explanation, but it happens all the time, where the sum of all the line items in a transaction doesn't add up to the actual final total on the mm -hmm. transaction. Um, now, you can't do anything about that. Uh, that's the data that's coming from PayPal. Um, so you need to, uh, at, at the very least, tell the user, hey, this error occurred, um, and uh, give them a way to correct it, or you know, insert an adjustment line, things like that. Um, and then uh, you, you're letting them do this to a degree um, where they're able to turn off the sync, mm -hmm. pause the sync, and then turn it back on. Um, so let them manage the sync and the schedule. Um, uh, turn off sync and turn it back on um, because fundamentally the customer knows the pace of their business. They know how important that real-time data is um, and so let me choose how often you're going to sync. Um, and uh, I've actually heard this um, before where a customer says, you know, real-time really doesn't matter to me until um, I'm supposed to provide a report to the business owner or the um, the board, um, and I want to have an up-to-date um, P&L oh, and balance sense. sheet and things like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, being able to go in and say sync now uh, is is one of those things that really gives the user that sense that they've got control. Um, and then uh, you know, uh, customers all the time they think they had it right when they set things up. Mm -hmm. um, and they liked the way the data was flowing in, but their accountant looked at it at the end of the quarter, the end of the month, and said, oh, you got this, these things wrong. It took me a couple hours to fix it. Um, and that's, you know, they're okay with that. That's kind of their, the order of business, but they want to make sure that you have the ability to fix that sync to do the right thing. Um, so uh, change some things up in the settings uh, from there. Um, and then, uh, you know, let me force a sync. Um, uh, you may only sync once a day, but sometimes you need that data that's up to date. Okay, okay. let me, if, if we can, let me sure. just quickly show you what I've done, which I think is really cool. Uh, so let's switch over here. 
Let me just make sure that I'm on my right branch of code here. All right, cool. So uh, hopefully this addresses some of what you were talking about, Peter. Um, So let's run this application again. Let me show you what I've added here. You can see it's still kind of a four step sync. Uh, mm -hmm. We still have the options to customize here, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's go ahead and look at our status now. This is where I really put in a lot of work now. Uh, you can see our sync status, nothing's happened yet, right? So you can't see any transactions. Um, but I give my user the control to decide when to run auto sync. And also, like you said, if they want to sync right now, they can click the button. Since we haven't run our first auto sync, it's not available yet, but they do have that option. And uh, I really want to show you what happens here when we start syncing. So let's go ahead and kick that off. We'll give it a, a minute or two here, or maybe uh, 10 seconds should all, uh, be all it takes. Awesome. awesome. So you can see that. Um, our last sync is up here. It says it's not completed yet. Our next sync is not scheduled yet because it's actually running now. So I, I report the status of the syncs. And um, I, I'm also showing everything that I write over to QuickBooks here. So just quickly show an example. Like you were saying, we can link right into these um, transactions. So I'm going to copy this and switch back over to QuickBooks. Paste in this URL and let's see what happens. So this would be a user coming to my website, clicking on that view in uh, QuickBooks link, and nice. then so yep. right, right to the transaction, they can see all the detail right there. So thanks for the advice. I think that really helped me a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Um, so let's uh, let's take it one step further. I think your user experience is, is exactly what we want. The data that um, you want uh, over there is, is exactly what we want. Um, but the reality now is that you know even the best systems fail, um, and a typical integration is a, uh, involving at least three different systems. And even if you have um, three nines and a five or four nines uptime, um, that's a total of a half day of downtime across those three systems. Um, Forty-seven thousand three hundred eleven seconds across those three systems. So you got to be prepared and retry. Um, don't just skip what you couldn't get. Um, uh, don't just give up. Uh, so when you see an error, um, be prepared for it um, and retry it later. And I touched on this uh, earlier. Um, Data is not always consistent. Um, PayPal total doesn't always match to the total of the line items, things like that. Um, so you want to notify the user and you want to be clear on what actions you took. And you really want to avoid skipping transactions. Nothing destroys the credibility of your app faster than um, four transactions came in and one didn't. Um, and uh, the business owner is going to be scratching their head for, for days or weeks trying to figure out why did that one transaction not come over. They're going to be calling support. They're going to be complaining both to our support and to your support. Um, so uh, avoid skipping those transactions unless there's a really easy way to review the skips, fix them, and, and resend them to QuickBooks. Um, so when things don't come consistently, uh, like the PayPal total um, and that sort of thing, use some adjusting lines to ensure that the bottom line matches, um, and those adjustments are really easy to find via reports. Um, so uh, you can create an adjustment account, you know, this Etsy adjustment account um, or PayPal adjustment account, um, and feed those adjustments in there, positive or negative. And when that starts to show up on the P&L or the balance sheet, then um, the user can click through and immediately see all the transactions that involved that yep. um, kind of adjustment. Um, and um, uh, with user errors or misunderstandings, um, uh, they can remove data that's critical to your system yep. working correctly. Um, we see this actually with PayPal integration where we create the PayPal bank account on behalf of the user if they don't already have one. Um, and uh, somebody goes and deletes that account uh, for whatever reason. Um, so you want to notify the user, be clear what happened and what actions you took and what they need to do to fix the sync. 
if they deleted that account and they delete, maybe they deleted it for some reason, you don't want to just recreate it. But, um, you might want to pause the sync and give them the opportunity to go in, fix, and tell us, okay, what bank, what account do you want us to use for your PayPal bank account, and and things like that. Um, so just be prepared for those unexpected things to happen and give your user the best possible experience around that. Um, so the key takeaway there is errors happen, handle them gracefully, make sure the user knows what happened. Okay. Um, so then kind of taking things out of the world of Etsy uh, for a moment, there's a couple of other um, gotchas that it's really worth uh, talking about. Uh, one of them is time data. Um, uh, we see it a lot, um, apps that are writing timesheet data to QuickBooks and that sort of thing, and that's incredibly valuable. Um, but it's important to understand that time has two distinct purposes in QuickBooks. The first is billing. Um, you want to bill for the time you spent. Time equals money, as I said at the beginning. So um, anything that's been marked billable or has a billable and has a billable customer, has a rate and service item associated, um, that time's coming over for billing purposes. And the other purpose is uh, payroll. You want to make sure that employees are getting paid for the time they're working for you and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you do need to be aware, and we hear this from customers all the time, even when the time that you're paying an employee for is also the time that you're billing a customer for, um, how you pay for that time may di differ from how you want to bill for that time. Um, uh, if the, you know, you may have an agreement with the employee that um, up to half an hour of um, extra work at a customer, uh, you're not going to pay them for, you're only paying them for eight hours a day and things like that. Um, but you still want to bill that customer uh, for the full um, eight and a half hours uh, and things like that. So um, you do need to be aware that how people want to pay for time is different from how they want to bill for that time. So you may want to move that time over in, in two different ways. Um, and you do notice that when time is marked billable, um, it opens in the drawer on the right-hand side of the invoice uh, as soon as you select the customer and, and they can just be added to the uh, transaction, which is a great way for um, any corrections to be made uh, to that data in real time uh, as the user's creating the thing. So some gotchas here. Um, you got to be careful of time zones and uh, really no excuses here. Um, right now, QBO is manifestly bad. Um, time is recorded and displayed in the server time. Whatever server that region is running in, um, uh, that's the time that applies, um, and that's specific standard time for most of the US and Canada and so forth. Um, GMT for the UK, um, Australian Eastern Standard Time for Australia and so forth. So. Um, being aware that we're not too good here, uh, study your users, understand their expectations uh, for how the time that you've recorded should show up in QuickBooks, and then adjust what you send to QuickBooks to meet that user's expectations between your system and ours. Um, it's complex, uh, so I can't go too deep into that, but um, it's, it's uh, really important to understand what your users want. Um, and you need to be cognizant that other systems might be writing time data and handle that appropriately. Um, so your system might expose an approval workflow for time. Um, so other apps might be writing time directly to QuickBooks. Um, should the user have the option of approving that time? Um, uh, so should you, read, be should you be reading time back from QuickBooks as well? Um, and then be aware of what time you're writing to QuickBooks and what time other systems are writing to QuickBooks. Um, only approved time. Um, if you have an approval workflow, that probably makes the most sense. Um, only billable time or only payroll, only time uh, for payroll purposes and so forth. And make sure that you're writing the data correctly over to QuickBooks for that. So time data is complex, even though it seems really simple at the outset. Um, as soon as you fold in these aspects, uh, it gets a little more complex. Understand those use cases and the QuickBooks user ca use cases for that um, deeply and what your customers' expectations are. Um, so that, uh, that pretty much uh, is our, our key best practices um, for, for this session. Uh, quick summary of the takeaways that have been on the various slides. Um, if somebody wants to grab a screenshot or anything like that, uh, feel free, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll open up to questions. 
Yeah, thank you, Peter. And Peter, uh, just so everybody knows, normally the Hangout ends at the top of the hour. We'll go ahead and go along as we had some technical difficulties. If anybody has any questions, we'll definitely let you guys jump in and ask those. And this deck is available on the uh, events page on the developer site. You, there's a button that says discuss, and I'll take you out to a discussion board. And on that page, the decks are available on that discussion page. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll let uh, the people jump in and ask questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, toss one out. Crickets, nobody has anything. Hi, this is Jack from Atex. Um, hey, Jack. Hi, we, we've been doing a lot of this since we've been doing with QB desktop for you know, a dozen years. Uh, one question I have, it's more technical than uh, application design oriented. Is that to this, uh, what is the proper way of displaying a transaction in QuickBooks? Is it just taking the URL as we see it on our you know QuickBooks screen, or is there a better way of doing it? Yeah, um, so we touched on that a little bit with the deep link uh, comment. So. Um, you, you actually send them to, because they may not be logged into QuickBooks yet and so forth, um, you can't just go to the URL as you see it when you when you look in QuickBooks. So um, we have a formula for, for creating that URL. Um, Peter, if you want to do a quick share and paste it again, um, we won't hit enter. Um, so you see it there, qbo.intuit.com slash login, and then um, query string parameters for the company ID, which is the deep link company ID. The page request, which is the type of transaction you're looking at, in this case, sales receipt, and the transaction ID, if you um, want to include the transaction ID. Now, you'll you'll notice a subtlety here. Um, there's actually two hooks in there um, because the page rec is um, the uh, the sales receipt to this transaction ID. Um, so, uh, slight subtlety, um, but this this is fundamentally how you link, and you can link to any transaction, any customer, anything in QuickBooks via this uh, formula. Um, if you look at the page rec, uh, that's fundamentally what you would see in um, QuickBooks. If once we go to that sales receipt, the QuickBooks URL becomes qbo.intuit.com slash app slash sales receipt hook transaction ID equals 3059. And we can see that. I'm going to hit enter. and. We'll see a resolve to the sales receipt yep. and the transaction ID. Yeah. So that's that's how you go, and you can go to anything in QuickBooks that way. Super. Hi, my name is Rachna, and I'm from Alchadai. I have a question regarding timesheet. Um, how do we sync timesheet from an application to QuickBooks? In our in our application uh, that says everything HR, we already have a timesheet, but we want to sync that timesheet to the QuickBooks uh, account. So is it yep. possible for an employee to uh, sync the QuickBooks or uh, sync the timesheet to the QuickBooks or just the administrator have the rights to sync the timesheet? Yeah, so um, a couple things there. Uh, first and foremost, yes, obviously you can write the time data. The, the object in question is a time activity object. Um, and uh, by the way, you might want to get back on mute so that we don't have the echo. Um, and uh, the 